sins, hoarding by his shaming. We still haven't been redeemed, and there's still no base amikdash. And we're still sitting here again, uh, another year mourning on Tishaba. The essence of the avoda for tonight, as it says in the Kina, the leil ze yifkiyun the elibul bonai. This is a night that is designated, set aside for crying. As it says in Eicha, Boko, Sivke, Balayla, cry in the night, specifically this night. And this is what Shlomo HaMelech in Koheles referred to as an ace Livkos, the time to cry. And the source of all the korbanos, all the sorrows, and all the crying is the crying that we did way back by Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim when the Meraglim came back and Klau Yisrael cried a Bechia Shalchinam, a worthless, senseless, meaningless crying crying where they felt abandoned, hopeless, where they felt that the Rabban Shalom hated them, abandoned them. They rejected Eretz Yisrael, rejected what the Beis Hamikdash represented. And Chazal described that as Igdimu Pela Ayin. They put their mouths before their eyes. They created a distorted, false reality with their mouths and then saw that reality as if it was real. And if we had corrected all of those sins, we wouldn't be sitting here. But as it says in Eicha, as the Palgemayim, the Nesivas, explains the the dimosa alechia bacho sivke balayla the dimosa alechia our tears are still on our cheeks meaning that the same crying and the same problems that they had are still around today what is the ticket so Chazal tell us that the tikkun is bechia ledoros, or as other midrashim say, bechia shel mamish. Hakadosh Baruch Hu ordained that we should cry generations on this same night to correct the crying that happened then, and the bechia that we cry every year on Tisha B'av is a bechia shel mamish is a worthwhile, substantive crying. And we cry at night also, where even if we can't see, and tears blind our eyes from seeing, we can still imagine. They imagined distortion. They imagined what was a lie. And we're supposed to imagine what's really true, even though we can't see it openly, even though the Rabbana Shalom's hiding from us. It's nighttime, it's dark. Our tears blind our eyes, but those same tears are salty tears that give kiyum, that preserve perhaps what was wrong, correct it, and someday will turn the events around completely. Svarim say what seems to be contradictory. Svarim explain there's two kinds of crying. Sometimes people cry because they want to alarm other people to help them. And sometimes people cry because they're just expressing their own grief and pain and they'd rather be alone. 
the crying where you're trying to alarm other people to help you, you cry in the daytime, where other people can see you crying and come to your aid. The crying where you want to <coughs> just express your pain and your grief personally, privately, you do at night. It would seem from there that the crying at night, therefore, is a very private crying that you don't want to involve other people in. And yet the Medrash says, Bochol Sivke Balayla, the reason we cry at night is because at night the sound of the crying extends and, and travels a lot farther than during the day when there's all the noise of the hustle and bustle of the daytime. At night things are quiet and a person's crying carries farther. But if the crying at night is not to alarm others, if it's to do it alone, why does that have to carry farther altogether? I was thinking perhaps the answer is the following. It's true we're crying tonight and there's really feel that nobody can help us except the Rabbanishal. And therefore we want our voice to travel far that the Rabbanishal should hear us. That is what the Mirror Mashkiach Rabbi Yerucham says that until Cloud Yisrael will come to the realization we have no one else to rely on. There's no one to cry for that's going to come to our aid except the Rabbanu Shalom. And therefore we cry at night because we feel alone. There's no one who can help us except we want our voice to travel far because we want the Rabbanu Shalom to respond. And that we've explained many times. That's like the crying of a Tinok. Tinok and Kinos are the same osios. Cry like a baby. The baby knows that he doesn't know what's wrong with him. He can't put it into words. Not even sure himself what the problem is, but he knows he's uncomfortable. Something's wrong. And he knows that if he cries, a father, a mother will hear and come and take care of him. So too we cry tonight like babies. Our kinos are the crying of a tino. Where we know that only our Father in Heaven can hear us and only He can help us. Could be that's a meaning of another medrash. The Medrash says that Cloud Yisrael told Yirmiyahu, you cry in the daytime and we'll cry at night. Cloud Yisrael understood that Yirmiyahu Novi on his level could find plenty of powers, spiritual powers, maybe physical powers that would help him. So you cry in the daytime, but we have to cry at night because we're crying basically and only the Rabbana is going to hear us. So you, Yirmiyahu, cry in the daytime and we'll cry at night time. That's what Chazal say, that even though Shari Tfilah Ninalu, even though the gates of Tfilah have been closed since the Beis Hamikdash has been destroyed, but Shari Dimalo Ninalu, it's that crying that really has an effect. And that's why crying is a very, very <coughs> inner feeling, an inner emotion. The word Bechi comes from the word Bechah, something that comes from way inside the person and the word Bechi is the same gematria as Lev something that emanates from the heart of the person the Medrash says that that Bechia shall mamash that substantive crying that we're supposed to cry throughout the generations is represented by two historical cryings one is Al Naros Bavel Sham Yoshavnu Gambochinu. After Khurban Bayes Rishon, we came to Naros Bavel and our enemies asked us to sing the songs of Tzion. And we answered them, Eich Noshir Ashir Hashem, the Eretz Nechor, Emeshkochech Yerushalayim, Tishkach Yemini, Al Naros Bavel Sham Yoshavnu Vagambochinu. That's the first Bechia Shalmamas. The second one is called the Rama Nishma Rochel Mevaka Al Boneho. That was the second historical substantive crying. These are the 
archetypes, the representation of what the kinds of crying are. I was thinking that they represent two kinds of crying. Sometimes a person cries because it hurts, because he recognizes what he's missing, he recognizes what he's lost, and he cries, intense crying over his plight, over his sad situation, and a Bechi like that, recognizing what you're missing, recognizing your shortcomings, recognizing what you've lost and wanting it back has tremendous power. We find by Ace of Russia that when he came in and found out that Yaakov Avinu had taken his brachas, he begged Yitzchak, his father, you must have something left, give me a bracha. And Yitzchak told him in all uncertain terms, there's nothing left, I gave him everything. The Torah says that Asa began to cry bitterly. And immediately after that, Yitzchak gives him a slew of brachas that we're suffering from till today that Asa gave those brachas, got those brachas. So the Bali Musar asked, where did the brachas come from? Two minutes before, Yitzchak told him there were no more brachas. Where did they come from? And the Bali Musar say that once Esau cried and he recognized what he was missing and he had such a tremendous desire to get those brachas, new brachas were created in heaven. So those, that, those tears, that kind of crying where a person recognizes what he's missing and he wants it so desperately to cry for it. And those emotions come up from, the, from his heart, creates Yeshuas, creates new bracha. And had we cried that kind of crying, before we went into Gaulus, we never would have gone into Gaulus. The Medrash said that Nebuchadnezzar told Nebuchadnezzar that he should not let the Jewish people cry, he should keep them busy moving and not let them rest and cry because if they cry we'll never be able to exile them and he did that kept them busy kept them from crying until finally they crossed the euphrates and they came to bother and at that point shom yoshav nu gambachinu then we sat and we cried and it says your Novi caught up with the jewish people who were sent into exile when they were sitting on naros bother and they were crying. And Yermiol told them, I swear to you, if you would have cried one cry while you still were in Eretz Israel like this, you never would have gone into Golis. So that crying where a person recognizes what he's missing and he wants it and he cries for it has tremendous, tremendous power. And that crying, Chazal tried to institutionalize and gave us an incentive every year to cry on Tisha B'av. And all the other things during the year, Zecher L'Churban, L'Sabala Yerushalayim, Lalos is Yerushalayim, Arosim Chasi, breaking a glass, and by a chasana, and all the other things that are Zecher L'Churban are to preserve this crying, at least to give us a chance to recognize what we're missing and to want it back. <coughs> that's the crying that's represented by the crying of Mamish of Al Naros Bodham. But there's another crying, a much, much more difficult and negative crying, but also Bechiyash of Mamish. And that is a Bechia where the person himself doesn't recognize that there's anything wrong. Doesn't feel that he's missing anything. Nothing pains him. Either because he's too busy to think, or because he's blinded by his tithes, and he's become spiritually sick, and that which is bitter to him is sweet, and that which is sweet is to him bitter. And then that person can't cry for himself. He doesn't know what to cry. He has no reason to cry. 
then other people cry for him. Rachel Mavaka Boneho. That's Rachel cried when Klal Yisrael were on their way into Golis. Like we said, they didn't cry then. They were too busy. They were too uh, involved to cry, to really realize what was going on. And it could be that's what the Pasuk says. Rachel Mavaka Boneho Ve'enam. And they're not crying, but she's crying for them. And that crying also helps. Even if a person can't cry for themselves, but others cry for them, then that also helps. He's chik for lach riseich. Ponevizhirov, Ratzal, explained the phenomenon which I saw many times, the opportunity to be in the past many times in South Africa. The community there are grandchildren, great-grandchildren from uh, Gdole Torah, Amile Chachamim from uh, Lithuania, who left South Africa years and years ago, came to the New World, and most of them gave up their Yiddishkeit. However, there's a phenomenon in South Africa of tshuva, unbelievable, more than anywhere in the world, where the or Sameach and others are tremendously successful in bringing these great-grandchildren, grandchildren of these illustrious families, all have names that are household words in the yeshiva world, the Shkops and the Meltzers and so on. And these children, the most easy place to make care of people, unbelievably easy. <coughs> and the Pandavis Yorov explained why. He said that when these children left their homes, the parents, the grandparents cried for them, knowing that they're not just going away physically, but many of them went away also far away spiritually. And those tears created a reality that one day those children, if not them, then the children's children, if not them, then the grandchildren came back to Torah. And what was the cause? The tears that those parents and grandparents shed. And tears and crying is so important. When a person cries, Chazal say, La'odam kosher, he cries for a, uh, a person, not a big tzaddik, just an odam kosher or the Svarim say, or anything that's kosher, any good cause a person cries for, bothers him that it's missing, that he doesn't have it anymore, something that's fit, befitting. So HaKadosh Baruch who counts every tear qualitatively and quantitatively, sofran, umonon, and puts it in his treasure house, and those tears have tremendous power. And those tears are the stones, the building materials, which the third day Samikdash will be built with. As it says, Hazorim Bedima, you plant with tears, literally. Berino Yiksori will harvest the results of those tears in the future, even if you don't see the results immediately. And the Peleyoetz mentions how important crying is and how important those tears are and how much they are can accomplish and therefore he says a person should try to cry and let his tears flow like a river but he also writes the following which is uh, reflective of the reality unfortunately that we experience the hein emesh hein admol shruos besim losenu lahotsi osom beisha Tears aren't something that you have in your pocket that you can just take out whenever you want. The Kama Pomi Manachu wrote him Lifkos Bechi Godl Kadas Malasos. Banachnu Omri Miite Roshenu Mayim Veinenu Mekor Dima. And many times we would like to cry. Cry for the right reasons, like tonight. And we beg the Rabbonishum, who will give me the ability to let my tears gush of Oman Nase? Our eyes are closed up and no tears come. 
and Yoshi Afilu Dima Achas, not one tear comes out. The Zemachmas mute their Kano, that's because we are of very, very low esteem. The Kotzer Hasogosainu, we don't really understand. Shein on the Yodi Machosarnu, we don't really appreciate what we're missing and how bad the situation is. Then Afshainu Lomituhara, and if we be more pure, the Ain Ain Afshainu Choshku Meros Beroash Goramnu. Even if we wouldn't intellectually realize and appreciate what's missing and how bad our situation is, but if we be a little bit purer, and therefore the tears don't come naturally like somebody who has somebody who just died in front of them. Oh, she ebayed Holno, or somebody went bankrupt. But if we be a little bit more pure, then even if we intellectually can't bring ourselves to crying, that the Rabbana Shalom, our Mazel, the Malach that represents us, would bring us to cry. And our tears would come. Even on that level. And therefore the tears don't come at all. So we should do what we can. The Therefore we have to try to arouse ourselves to cry. Think. Think of things that sadden you, that should make you cry. Sometimes a person, if he directs his thoughts properly, can bring himself to cry. Well, if he go to school us at most, royalist chazik lotzia b'shayt, then it's a proper thing to do because the power of those tears is unbelievable. So it's kedai to put in the effort to try to cry. Vim lo yochol b'shum ofen lahotzidim. What if after all that, our hearts are stone, and we can't even bring out one tear? Then yitain is kolo bebechi. At least make the sounds of crying even if you're not really crying and really if you don't have tears drip, uh, dripping from your eyes but at least make the sounds of crying even that is choshev to the Rabbana Shalom ki dechseed suri mimeni ko poa leoven ki shoma Hashem kol bichyi not bichyi but kol bichyi just the sound of crying itself even a person who can cry should cry quietly between him and the Rabbana Shalom. People shouldn't make fun of him. People shouldn't uh, think he's a Malgaiva. Everything is according to the person, the place, the time, when it's proper to cry extra loud when it's proper to keep quiet a little bit but the main thing is whatever a person can do to cry there's sometimes it's proper for a person to cry out loud and try to arouse others to cry and sometimes it's possible it's proper to hide your cry Every person should know how to properly bring out this tremendous koach of Christ. And at least we should be happy that we're allowed to cry. Short mice in here. After World War II, the concentration camps were liberated. The girl's mother held on to her tightly with both hands, and the American soldiers were there, liberated the camp, and a mother and daughter were walking before them. She was not going to let go. The American soldiers observing the spectacle could not understand what was going on. Although they had witnessed horrific scenes during the war, this mother and daughter stopped them in their tracks. Cautiously, they moved forward, not wishing to alarm the mother and daughter. 
The soldiers were now perhaps 20 yards from the mother and child, but the woman and her dazed child seemed entirely oblivious to the approaching soldiers. Suddenly the young girl looked up at her mother, Mommy, is it okay to cry now? The soldiers could not move. The realization of what had happened now hit them. As would later be confirmed, this small girl and her mother had been hiding from the German murdering machine for the past 11 months. Prior to their entering the hiding place, the child's mother had made her promise she would not make a sound. She had not even been permitted to cry. Her mother kissed her and held her as she whispered in her ear, Cry, Mamala. Go ahead, you can cry now. Baruch Hashem, we're allowed to cry. How can we not take advantage? And even worse, and the Chalmaniki hordes of Cossacks moved from village to village, killing Jews by the thousands, wiping out entire communities a matter of days. But Saul Rosengarten, the to town shochet, his wife and two-year-old son, sought refuge in their next-door neighbor's wine cellar, along with 12 other members of their small community. As the screams of the victims were heard just outside the house, those in hiding gave each other a knowing glance. Their house was next. A thick tension filled the cellar as only their heavy breathing was audible. The sounds of maniacal killers thrashing about just a few feet above them had them frozen in fear. They estimated that the men screaming above would probably finish soon and move on down the road. Then they would be safe. All of a sudden, the silence of the cellar was broken. Their greatest fear was realized when Betzal's two-year-old son let out a cry. The others in the group turned to Betzal and his wife and whispered forcefully, keep that baby quiet. It was imperative that nothing give away their hiding place. <coughs> Betzal and his wife did everything they could, but their baby was hungry. No matter what they tried, they couldn't keep him quiet. In a moment of panic, the little boy's mother placed her hand tightly over her son's mouth, and then their baby was quiet forever. Baruch Hashem. We're allowed to cry, and we can cry. Our only problem is that we find it difficult to cry. And some of us don't even know what there is to cry about, to cry about themselves. The main thing is to cry, Eicha, Chazal say, Eicha, Zayeka, where are you? Where could you be? Where are you? What are you missing? How did it happen? And how can you correct it? That's what to cry about. <coughs> <coughs> and your Mi'an Novi made it easy for us because he put into Eicha all the tears and all the crying of all the generations and if you look in Eicha and you listen carefully you'll find the key to all the Tzoros private, individual communal Cloud Yisrael Tzoros from all the generations and it'll help to bring that crying out from your heart and this night especially has a special power to make that crying of the Chia Shalmanish and to be successful in overcoming all those sorrows. Because this night, aside from the night that Cloud Yisrael cried, the Chia Shalchinam, there's another thing that happened this night. And that's why the Rabban Shalom made the Miraglim come back, Tisha B'Av night. That's the night that Yaakov Avinu fought with the angel of Esau and overcame him. That was Tisha B'Av night. So this night has in it tremendous negative powers. It also has tremendous positive powers. We can cry the wrong kind of crying. We can be totally insensitive, or we can cry the crying that really will correct everything. And I was thinking not to end with a story, because we don't need any stories. Look around. How many young people are there in our Kehila and in every Kehila in Klal Yisrael? Whether it's here in Eretz Yisrael, whether it's in Telstone or Beitar or Yerushalayim, children who don't know that there's something to cry about, who the Yetzirah has pulled them away with all its tithes, with Gili Arayis and Alimut, Shichas Domim and Avodah Zorah. And they've gone away from Derech Avoseinu, off the Derech. And they don't know what there's to cry. They don't know what. They're spiritually sick and what's bitter, they think is sweet. 
and what's very sweet they think is bitter. They damage themselves physically, spiritually, destroying their lives in this world and the next world. You need stories. Everybody has their own personal story. The community has its story. All the communities, it's not only here in Eretz Israel, Chutz Laaretz, go Friday night in Flatbush and see how many tens, if not hundreds, of you hang out on Ocean Parkway with drugs, Chil Shabbos, every manner of Aveira you can imagine. And these are from good, fine, from homes. And we don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. We have no solutions. And we try and try and it seems like nothing works. So these unfortunate souls can't cry for themselves. At least we can cry for them. You don't need stories. Cry. Cry for your own children. Cry for your neighbor's children. Cry for Cloud Yisrael's children. Live in a generation where everybody hears the eyes, the iPhones and the iPads, but the real eye, Anochi Hashem Elokecho, that they don't hear. I do want to mention a story because maybe it'll give us a little incentive. My story is unfortunately a pretty common one. As a teenager, I walked around seeing life in shades of gray. My home situation wasn't the best, warning, understatement. And there was little happening in the way of communication between my parents and me. Life was not a joy thing. I felt as if I were carrying a skyscraper on my shoulders and the burden was dragging me farther and farther down to a place where I didn't want to go. The situation was made worse by the fact that I kept all my thoughts to myself. I communicated with no one, preferring to remain secluded in a world of my own making. The world was moody and self-absorbed, starring myself as the tortured, misunderstood main character. The rest of humanity was cast in the role of those who just didn't understand. Needless to say, I was not a happy camper. And he goes on to say that he had a Rebbe. My Rebbe's name was Rabbi Shimshin Jacobowitz. If there was one bright spot in my lonely existence, he was it. He gave me bright, encouraging smile every morning and a warm pat on the back. And for a moment, I'd feel like spilling everything inside me, but something always held me back until the moment had passed and I'd missed the opportunity. And one day, Rabbi Jacobowitz, Good morning, Yudi, Rebbe said. Good morning, Rebbe. How's it going? Baruch Hashem, fine. I said Baruch Hashem, fine, when I really wanted to tell him that I had another fight with my parents the night before, and they grounded me for the next week, and I was going crazy listening to Jewish music all the time, but didn't want to listen to the other stuff, because I knew that it was poison for my neshama. I wanted to tell him that I was all mixed up, but all I said was Baruch Hashem, fine. I was at my locker gathering my stuff together after davening when I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned and saw Rabbi Jacobowitz standing there. Rebbe, you the, are you free this evening? Free? Yes, as in, do you have plans for tonight? No. Good, because I want to invite you out for dinner. Rebbe wanted to invite me for dinner? I'd never heard of him doing such a thing before. I have to call my mother and tell her that I'll be late, but I think it's okay. Great, give her a call. My mother was more than happy to give me permission. Enjoy yourself, you the, I will. And tell Rabbi Jacobowitz, thank you from us. I will. Okay, see you later. He goes to describe their meal. They talked and made small talk, and he still couldn't open up. And finally, at the end of the evening, well, Yudi Rebbe said, thanks for joining me for din. And that was as far as he got. At first, I thought he had something stuck in his throat. But the next thing I knew, I heard a strangled sound and realized that Rabbi Jacobowitz, my Rebbe, was crying. He was bawling his eyes out. He knew that I needed someone to talk to. He knew that I wanted to bear my soul, and he knew how difficult it was for me to open up. 
but he so badly wanted to help me find myself that his frustration and his inability to get through to me had made him break down. And those tears, those tears washed everything away. When I saw my precious Rebbe, whom I loved and revered, crying like that because of me, it did something to me. It pierced my outer core, cut through the cement, and hit me right where it counted. Suddenly I couldn't hold myself back any longer. Tears came to my eyes and I let them fall. I allowed myself to yield control. I relaxed my rigid shoulders and let myself slump into the seat. I trusted my impulse to let go and to finally break out. I cried. Wow, did I cry. We cried together, our tears mingling as his neshama communicated with mine without words. It was a surreal experience. And then we began to talk, to really talk. Our conversation lasted for two hours and it was the most intense conversation of my life. And as we spoke, I could feel a certain elusive peacefulness begin to descend upon my soul. And I knew that a miracle was taking place before my very eyes. That conversation changed my life. Let me rephrase that. My Rebbe's tears changed my life. His tears broke the barrier, allowed us to have the kind of conversation that I wanted, needed, and hadn't been able to allow myself. Years have passed since that fateful evening in my Rebbe's car, but the copious tears running down his cheeks and into his beard and the talk that followed are still as real to me as the moment they happened. I found myself that night. I owe my Rebbe my life. So maybe if we can't do anything, and we have no, we feel totally incapable of finding solutions, but at least cry. Cry on Tisha B'Av and let your children know that you're crying for them too. And if they can't cry and they don't feel the pain, at least we feel the pain. And maybe those tears will open up their nishamas too. And if not tomorrow, then maybe next week. And if not next week, maybe their children. It's a shame if we take the ability and we have the crying of Alnaros Bavel crying ourselves for what we understand we're missing, and crying for others who don't understand what they're missing. The crying of Rachel Mavakal Boneha, then the Rabban Hashem will tell us, like he told Rachel, Yesh Tikvalach Riseich, Veshavu Bonim Ligvulam, children will return. Not today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. But all of us in Mirza Hashem will return. Veshavu Bonim Ligvulam, and next year we won't be sitting here on the floor. We'll be sitting in the Beis Hamikdash, the Simcha Gedola, celebrating the Moed of Tisha B'av, the Simcha the Sosa, of what it means to have gone through this long Golos and finally have persevered and overcome and reached the purpose of all these Kinos, the Tikkun, same Osios as Kinos, the correction of everything that happened. And finally we'll be able not to cry anymore Mocha Hashem Dimo Me Al Koponim. The Rabban Hashem then will wipe tears and won't have to cry anymore. We'll be able to rejoice. Simcha Gedola, the Viasko El Sedek, the Gate of Yom.